The following program has been pre recorded, so please don't call in at this time. If you wish to participate in the program, tune in at 5 p.m. every Wednesday for A Pause for Thought on Baton Rouge Community Radio. Good evening, fellow humans. This is Wayne Parker with a pause for thought here on Baton Rouge Community Radio. 96.9 FM here in Baton Rouge. Well, it's good to be back in the saddle again, Lang. Um, Greetings, everyone. Oh, by the way, that's Lang Baker I'm just speaking with. He's my faithful co-host, co-runner of a pause for thought. Good evening, Lang. Howdy, Wayne. Always good to have you here. Good to be here myself. Um, considering the alternatives. But anyway, this is a live call-in show. If you'll forgive me for adjusting my mic, we had to do a little few few adjustments here to our operation here in the studio. Um, this is a live call-in show. Please feel free to call in and share your thoughts and questions on the topic of the evening or anything even vaguely related to it. I guess 343-9927, 343-9927 is the number to call. And our topic for the evening is what makes a great leader, or even just a leader. I mean, you know, we 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 seem to have been having a problem settling on just things. But um, okay, so Lang, what defines a great leader? I'll put it on you. <laughs> Tell us all. Uh, I I would say that a great leader. Uh, Number one has to be somebody who has led, that there's no such thing as a great leader who has never led, which I think we may have a difference of opinion on that one. Well, we decided that was a philosophical difference, and we'll leave that aside because we'll go... Getting beyond that, I think it depends on what area of leadership the person is in as to what makes a great religious leader is probably different than what great makes a great military leader or what makes a great political okay, leader wait, or a great wait, wait, leader wait, wait, in business. Wait. <laughs> yeah. Okay, how do we define a great leader, though? Would it not be someone who leads a bunch of people successfully for a goal? To a, to a, well, even not successfully, someone who leads um, a lot of people or the appropriate number of people toward a certain goal. Mm, well, I again, I think it would depend on the context uh so well, far as okay. how many people, if if you're uh, lost in the wilderness and it's a group of five people, there can be a great leader from among those five. It doesn't have to be a huge number of people involved and, and to be he a would, great leader. Right, and he would be the one who... She. Or she. Yeah, look, I'm not going to get into that, but you're right. He or she. Um, he, she. How about... Will that satisfy you, Lang? But uh, anyway, the leader would be someone who is able to convince everyone else that they have the best they offer the best chance for survival i'll put it that way he may not be he or she may not be right in their chosen path but if they if everyone else can, believes that their idea is better than theirs i guess you know what I'm, you know what i mean well the way i would approach that is it's not that they have to convince so f- much as the person has to actually be th- the one who leads. But now it may it may involve some convincing, or it may be the other four in this group of five spontaneously say, you know, recognize that this is the person from their past experience with the person. That this is the one best, most likely to succeed in getting them out safely from their yeah. condition, and so. There's no convincing involved there. It's something that's spontaneously recognized that this is yes. the person best suited to lead us in this situation for this goal. And so what do the people see in that person that would give them that confidence? Well, going back to the context, I think it would be their judgments about the ability of that individual to handle the difficulties confronting them in their situation. Okay, yeah. Uh, but what, and so what, what is required to successfully manage that depends on what the situation is. Like I, I posited a situation where they're lost in the wilderness. That's going to require different qualities 
to be recognized that this is the person best qualified to lead us successfully to our goal than if they're um, in a competition of some kind, maybe in a sports event, who's going to be the captain of the team? Okay, let's back up. Um well, I'm not so sure the captain of the team and the leader to help them survive would necessarily be different, but... Um, well, they would, they would need to be perceived as having the skills best suited to... Right, okay. No, I, I agree with that. Okay, but here, here's something else now. Let's say a person comes to the fore to lead a group, and they all recognize, well, he, he's, he, we're going to follow him. He has the qualities we want. And they get to a point where... They realize that this guy is wrong, and they trust him up to that point or her, and they start questioning the leader. How the leader responds to their questioning might determine if he, he or she is going to continue leading them. Do you know what I'm saying? So, so that would be another that would be another quality that a good leader, a great leader, would have to have, is to recognize when they might be wrong. Listen to to listen to their followers. If if their followers are saying, "Wait a minute, I'm not so sure of this," I mean, we're talking a small party here now, of course. Right, right. So how would how would you go? I mean, that's another. First, they'd have to be inspired, or they would have to inspire confidence in the people that end up following them. Then that would be a spontaneous thing. But then they'd have to show another quality later on down the road. Um, they might also, for the success of the whole party, um need to be able to recognize the individual strengths and weaknesses of the people in the group for assigning appropriate tasks and knowing when someone might need help, things like that. So it's, they have to read their their followers, so to speak, or, you know. Yeah, so there may, there may be some uh, quality required here of being able to relinquish leadership when they recognize that Maybe I, I've been the right leader to get us to this point, and someone else is more appropriate to lead us from here forward to the next. And I step. would yes, and I would say that would be a quality of a good leader. A great leader would be someone who recognizes when they're out of their depth, and then somebody else has stepped forward. And I wonder, you know, of course, there's human pride and all that stuff, but um, you know, I could see where I've I've known people who were leaders who did step aside when they had gone far enough and recognized that somebody else was more competent to take the group to the next, you know, step or whatever. Mm -hmm. But um, what about what about Hitler? Uh, was he a great leader? Well, the <laughs> he led a lot of people. He was he was successful in in convincing a large number of people that he could be their great leader and whether I wouldn't say that, that makes a person a great leader being able to convince the people I suppose this brings up the question of whether of what role the the goal plays in determining whether a person is a great leader that was my question does it, does it require yeah. Uh, the, the Reverend Jim Jones, for instance, he was a great leader in that he got his followers to drink the Kool-Aid. Drink the Kool-Aid, yes. We got a call coming in. Let me. Good evening. You're on the air with a pause for thought. Maybe we know who's calling, please. This is Mike. Hey, Mike. Yeah, talking about leadership. Uh, seems to me most people judge uh, great leaders in the rearview mirror. Uh, you hear, you know, oh, so-and-so showed great leadership as he was coming up through the ranks, blah, 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 example this, example that. I think that's a totally different question from what does it take to be a great leader? And in part, the test is in the results. Uh, uh, you may be able to mobilize tremendous numbers of people and be very good at what you do and mesmerizing and so on, uh, and then the movement fail. Uh, I'll keep on going. Okay. Well, Mike makes some good points there, but here again, we haven't really adequately defined what it means to be a leader. And for me, 
to be able to lead large numbers of people successfully for to a goal, or even like in, you know Robert E. Lee, he was a great leader, great general in the Confederate Army, and although he lost the war, he showed great leadership in recognizing that they weren't going to win, and he didn't want to sacrifice any more men in a lost cause, so he surrendered. And to me, that was a great leader. Um, but getting back to the Jim, Reverend Jim Jones, I mean, he inspired his followers to drink the Kool-Aid. So he was a successful leader. I don't know that we'd call him great, but um, you know what I'm saying. I mean, he, he, he successfully led these people to his goal, and one that he apparently convinced them uh, was also their goal. I don't know. Of course, I wasn't there, obviously, because I'm still talking. But, um, you know, that, that's the way I see it there. But thinking about Mike's comment, too, about the um, great leaders judge in the rearview mirror, I remember when I got to my first ship in the Navy, we had uh, terrible Teddy Olmsted as our captain. Um, the crew called him Terrible Teddy, but it was an affectionate name. He was an ignorant son of a gun. Man, I, I, you know, I would read his, you know, statements and all in the plan of the day and think, my goodness, this, this guy hasn't read a book in his entire life. But he, he was ornery. He fiercely defended our, his ship, his crew. We knew that he, he had our, ba our back. Excuse me. And then he was replaced by some guy named Jack Shaw, who was nothing more than an ambitious, um, you know, ticket. You know, he wanted to get his ticket punched to move up and become Commodore, and we hated his guts. Um, and, you know, I, I think at the time we recognized Terrible Teddy as a great captain. And we would have followed him, you know, and done, you know, well, we did. We, we, we operated in accordance with what he told us to do because we knew that we, he had our best interests, you know, at heart. Whereas Jack Shaw, we hated his guts. At least I did. I hated that. I and mean, he was the only person in my life I've ever hated. But, um, you know, no, we, none of us liked him, really. But uh, so we knew right then that he wasn't a good leader. You know, it, I mean, every, every chance we got, we tried to sabotage him. In fact, in fact, on my ship, we came the closest I've ever heard of a modern Navy ship coming to a mutiny that I've ever seen. But that's mm. that's for another story. But uh, anyway, um, so I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure I agree that all great leaders or poor leaders are judged in the rearview mirror because I, I've seen instances where people recognized they had a good captain and would follow him, you know, and, and liked him. Um so anyway, yeah. Well, I think I think there's some some merit in the rearview mirror theory that when we look back historically, I'm not sure that people who are judged as great leaders at the time are forever judged that way. Whether who's regarded as a great leader may change over time. That at one time they were thought they they were a great leader, and later they were thought not to have been, and later they were thought again to have been. Or whether, in from different cultural perspectives, what one, what people in one country may regard as a great leader may not be regarded as a great leader from the people in another country, uh, just because they disagree with what the goals were, or they disagree with what qualities they consider to be great leaders. There's been some studies on, on. Uh, modes of leadership is what they refer to it as. And they describe these different modes as being ways of exercising leadership and how they have changed through time. And part of the theory is that uh, as a person grows and evolves in their, their way of being in the world, they change the way they operate as a leader. Mm -hmm. uh, mode one is referred to as technical leaderships, technical leadership, uh, where they address technical problems. And then later comes cooperative leadership, where you're looking more at the cooperation of the, of the people within the group that you're leading. And then on to collaborative leadership and generative leadership, the last is where they see the ambiguities that the, that the team is working on in terms of what are the opportunities here for for the group to transcend what the problems presented by the ambiguities were. And then the then it's been proposed that there's a fifth mode 
democratic leadership where leadership is viewed as a process in which all the citizens participate. It's not like there's a single leader. It's a, it's a, view, it's a different view of what leadership is. And so what may be, someone who may be regarded as uh, a great leader addressing technical issues might not be a great leader in, in uh, uh, facilitating collaboration within the group. But then when they move to the next level of in, the, in this hierarchy of modes, then they, be, they become uh, capable of fostering this collaborative relationship among their team. And so they've reached a higher level of leadership through a different way of relating. And so this particular theory is, proposes these, these four different levels Right, and what I'm leadership. wondering, what I'm wondering, Lang, is, uh, for instance, you, you b- before we went on the air, you mentioned um, Mao Tsung, Mao Zedong. Mao Zedong. Yeah, Chairman Mao. Whether or not he was a great leader, you know, period. And from what I understand, he was a great leader in succeeding with the communist revolution. But after that, he was a, a goof up, you know. So maybe in that instance. Once that goal was achieved, it might have been better for him to step aside and let somebody with different leadership qualities step in because now the context has changed. The, the goal has changed. I don't know that, but I think that's, that's kind of, to me, speaks to what you're talking about here. Uh, yes, once, so, once you reach a certain goal, you may, not, you may no longer be the suitable leader. Yeah, it strikes me as, as like a parallel way of thinking that there it's like with changing goals, different qualities are required of the person who's going to take the leadership role because their different skills are required to address the different problem that this group's confronting at that time. Uh, For instance, you have a team. You mentioned a team earlier. Um, so if you have a team, then chances are everybody's on board with the goal. So, but that would come later. Um, if, say, you're a group in the wilderness, you would need to have the leadership skills to create a team first or convince everybody that they were a team. You know, so that would take a certain set of skills there, uh, and different skills probably than to be the leader of the team that's already formed, maybe. Uh, mm-hmm. Oh, well, uh, let me take a break here and let my brain cool off. This is uh, Wayne Parker with a pause for thought, where uh, Lang Baker and I are talking with talking about what it means or what what makes a great leader. Three four three nine nine two seven is the number to call to help us out with this, uh, or make it even more complex. Three four three nine nine two seven. Let us know what you think. Um, well, Lang, there are we're kind of beating around one of the well, the study of great leadership actually, which goes back hundreds of years, which kind of flattered me since I thought of this all on my own. I think, and uh, you know, so I guess I'm just like all those great people hundreds of years ago, right? Um, yeah, great leader of. A pause for thought. Yeah, there you go. I'll I'll, satis- I'll be satisfied with that. Uh, at least I can work the board. You can't. Um, anyway, but there were there was originally a theory, a trait theory of leadership in Western history, um, that tended to believe that there were certain personal qualities or traits that were necessary for a person to be a leader or you know even a great leader. They had to possess certain st- traits. Um, in fact, there were, if I could find it here, oh yeah, it was on the flip side of this. There were numerous uh, suggestions, and I think you mentioned this too, um, Sanskrit literature uh, broke them up into what aristocratic type of leaders. It was based on their blue blood or their genes. Um, that was a theory. Um, the paternalistic type people, um, you know, the macho. And the divine right of kings. Divine right of kings, yes. Leadership is bestowed by God. Right, by God. And, um, you know, of course, these aren't really traits. These are roles, is the way I see them. But the traits, the trait theory was the one that predominated. And then in the 40s and 50s, they, a couple of guys came up with ideas about um, situational um, qualities or situational um, leadership. Um, 
See, while some traits were common across a number of studies, the overall evidence suggested that persons who are leaders in one situation may not necessarily be leaders in other situations. And that's, and that's what we were talking about here. And, and like I said before the show, I kind of think, from my experience, it's a combination of both the personal traits of, of the individual has and the situation. But, of course, what I was thinking of is, as far as the situation creating the leader would be um, like Dr. Martin Luther King. If he hadn't been the youngest guy at the minister's convention in Birmingham, he would never have been given the chance to give his first speech and inspired people to follow him, you know. So he was already, in my opinion, a great leader, but he hadn't been discovered yet. But anyway, we don't need, I digress, but you know, I got to get my little digs, you know, my little points <laughs> in. But, um, but here again, he had the qualities, he had the traits, it turned out, and it was the situation that brought him to the fore where his traits ended up inspiring people to fo- excuse me to follow him and actually go out and march or risk their lives and be killed and injured um because of his leadership yeah and and so also another another angle on that is that he was had the traits that were appropriate for the situation both what was going on in the society at that time, also what the goals were in the emergence of those goals or the movement of those goals towards the forefront of societal conversation, and also uh, the mobilization of people, the enthusiasm of people to pursue those goals were things that he contributed to those and they were also pre-existing that he stepped into that cultural setting yes um yes he also was enabled was able to inspire many white americans to come out and and protest and join them in their marches too which by pointing out that you know there are many people that agree with us that are remaining silent and Mm -hmm. we we suffer as a result you know we all suffer but i'm you know i was thinking too that um if i were a young black man back in that day I probably, knowing my personality back then, I probably would have followed Malcolm X because he was a much tougher, sharp-edged speaker, I think. He told it the naked truth. you know. And actually, I was surprised there were a lot of African-American leaders back then that I was not aware of, like James Baldwin, um, Muhammad Ali. You know, the, the things I've heard those men say in the past... Um, I'm like, how can anybody deny that? How can anybody disagree? You know, I don't care how white and bigoted you are. You can't disagree with their their truths. And that would have inspired me to follow people. But uh, I think King had the broader vision, and and he gained the support of other leaders among white society, too, you know, that um, he drew them in. Yeah, and another facet of this that's just occurring to me is how they were portrayed in the media at the time. Right. You know, there's a certain part of the image of anyone who gains wide media coverage that is a function of how the media is portraying those individuals. Yeah, that's really not a fair judgment of the leader, but it is a factor. You're right. It's certainly yeah, nowadays. So could, yeah. could a great leader become a great leader without the media in some way spreading a particular representation of or, that individual. Or vice versa. Could a perfectly capable leader be neutralized by uh, things? And now I'm thinking about, now I don't know m- much about what Adlai Stevenson was like, but he was the Democratic candidate that ran against Eisenhower. Twice. Twice, okay. Um, I didn't know that, but um, I think the Eisenhower, first Eisenhower Adlai Stevenson election was the first one that was televised in the country. And Eisenhower had him beat hands down because the media portrayed him or his people portrayed him as a fatherly, you know, good husband, successful general, blah, blah, blah. And Adlai Stevenson, who probably was far more political savvy, politically savvy and more competent, would have been a more competent president. He didn't have the qualities to perform well on television. And so he fell flat. You know, he, he was he was bombed by uh, this by by show, basically, by form instead of substance. So you're right. You know, the media does have a big uh, influence, especially nowadays. 
And um, as a matter of fact, David Halberstam in his book, The Powers That Be, showed uh, what he believed, and I happen to agree with, was the degeneration of American politics beginning with radio because it allowed the politicians to go directly to the people and influence them with cheap, you know, tactics that didn't necessarily um, convey good leadership and it misled a lot of people. And then TV made it even worse, you know, until we have Donald Trump for president. But anyway. Yeah, so that that presents again a, a question about the leader as an individual who is great for the job versus a leader who is skillful at Conning recruiting people. Yeah. people to follow them. Right. And I wonder, I wonder too, if the um, immediacy of the, ta- of the task at hand would have something to do with that, too. I mean, Americans perceive themselves as being pretty comfortable right now. So they're not, in my opinion, not that critical or don't tend to be as critical of the goals being expressed or the the methods being expressed or proposed as they would be if our survival depended upon it. Yeah, well, I don't know uh, how to judge what percentage of the population falls into different categories along that line, but there are uh, portrayals in the media of large segments of the population being very dissatisfied in different directions about different issues. Uh, you can see that in large protests that have occurred on all sides, on all, all sides, sides yes. on all kinds of issues of dissatisfaction uh, with the direction of the country. Yeah, and I, and I would wonder if that, if getting back to the topic of leaders loosely, if maybe people are expecting and have been expecting far more from Washington D.C. than what they have a right to expect. You know, I think that I think they've given the federal government. Far more than it can competently handle, really, is, is, is I wonder about that. You know, so th- if we consider the federal government as a leader, um, it's failing by virtue of the fact that we have so many people who are upset with what's going on. Um, yeah. you know. Well, and, and another angle is, you know, con- contrary to the idea that has the government taken on too much, is has the government taken on too little? Because of special interests buying them off, and they're not taking on things that they were expected to have taken on. Right. Oh, yeah. No, I agree. Uh, Yeah, and as I approach, you know, my dotage, I guess, um, I think about our health care and the complete lack of leadership in this country in dealing with that. You know, because I. Climate change. Climate change, also, yes. Environmental pollution of all kinds. Yeah. But anyway, um, here again. Wall Street regulation. That would be. That would be. If, if, like I said, if we were to call the federal government a leader, we would probably agree that they're a poor leader because they don't have their priorities straight. Well, or, that gets a, a different dimension of this is whether we can talk about an institution as being a leader or not or a st- political structure as being a leader or not as opposed to an individual being a leader or not or a group of individuals being a leader or not. When you talk about government's not a good leader, it's kind of... A conceptual mis- mis- mismatch in my mind. I think you're probably that, right, yeah. Um, well, yeah, but it would take leaders to get the government to implement programs, I guess. But, you know, just getting, getting back to the have, whether or not you have the faith and confidence of the people you would lead um, or that you're the people you would want to be cooperating toward a particular goal if if we looked at it that way, our government would be a poor leader, you know. But then that's I, it, I was broadening it there, but as an analogy is all. But um. well, here's here's a different take about what the whole notion of a leader is. We, we've been thinking in terms of a leader as someone who is facilitating the movement towards a goal for a group, and this is. A, a style of leadership that's been called narcissistic leadership. Narcissistic, narcissistic leadership, according to Wikipedia, is a leadership style in which the leader is only interested in him or herself. So there's no group being led there under that style of leadership. They, I guess they've been put into a position that's regarded as being a leadership position, but they're not doing any leading towards a goal for a group. 
Well, then they're interested it, only in him or herself. The priority in, is themselves at the expense of their people or group members. The leader exhibits the characteristics of a narcissist, arrogance, dominance, and hostility. It is a sufficiently common leadership style that it has acquired its own name. Okay, but now with the little bit of time we have left, again, if we get back to the um, people trapped in the wilderness and someone comes to the fore as a leader or two people pop up as potential leaders, in a situation that's that serious, would people, which one would the people gravitate toward? You know, the one that came up with the most competent idea and had the most commanding presence or the con man? I don't know. Depending don't know. on how yeah. skillful the con man is, I would guess. I suppose. Um, I suppose. But I, I, I I'd have to think that I would bust that team up because I wouldn't follow the guy, you know. I'm not presuming that I wouldn't be fooled by his act either, but you know, so I presume a lot of things like that about myself that I probably shouldn't. Anyway, Lang, um, we've run out of time. Talked ourselves silly. Well, speaking for myself. <laughs> anyway, you've been, you've been listening. Uh, yeah, no, of course you won't. You've been listening to Wayne Parker and Lang Baker here on A Pause for Thought on 96.9 FM here on Baton Rouge Community Radio. we got to go. We thank you for listening. You have a good night.